Of the contenders, who stands the best chance to win the ACC in 2023? Will an ACC team make the college football playoff, or could we see a dark horse make a run this season? The Ultimate College Football Preview is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an, app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. I'm Candace Cooper here from Locked On ACC, and when looking at contenders in the ACC, I have a group of gentlemen here that are going to talk me through just why their schools might be the one to win it all. We have Kenton Gibbs here from Locked On ACC, joins me each and every day wherever you listen to podcasts. Then we have Grayson Boone from Locked On Wolfpack, and you know, it's nice to meet you, Grayson, finally hear all the things, all the things. And finally, Damian Parson from Locked On Clemson, a newbie, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Welcome, fellas. Let's, let's get into it. Let's do, let's do it. it. Wonderful. So let's talk through, you know, the fact that we have some ACC contenders. I want to start with Grayson and, and, of course, you chime in. Y'all are probably the dark horse out of all the contenders we have here. But Brendan Armstrong allegedly is supposed to be the guy. He's he got a new fresh arm. Been in rehab, doing all the things. And NC State's defense is NC State's defense. So can you tell me, Grayson, a little bit of why you feel like NC State could do it all? I do like the angle of a dark horse for NC State. There's kind of a saying amongst our fan base that when you expect the least, that's when you get the most out of these NC State teams. And so you could have a prime example here in 2023. But, yes, we are bringing on Brennan Armstrong from Virginia Uh, Of course, probably most known for his 2021 season where he threw for legitimately a billion yards uh, with the Cavaliers. But we also bring in his old offensive coordinator from Virginia in Robert Anai, which is a lot of cause for some excitement here in Raleigh. Still some things that uh, probably it's going to hinge a little heavier on than just Armstrong and Anai. But certainly, uh, certainly a lot of things to look forward to offensively. A thousand percent. There are two things that travel in football. There are two things that are universal through any type of weather in football. That's a running game and defense. And NC State has one of the best defenses in the nation. They have one of the best corners in the nation in terms of the player who played the most cover snaps without a touchdown allowed in Aiden White. They've got a linebacker who... I I kid you not, when I saw him play once in high school, I saw him play for a legitimate five minutes, and I realized, oh, he's different. That's the guy that is is going to be a program changer in Peyton Wilson. They have one of the most underrated defenders, uh, especially up front in the nation in terms of Davin Van. And and C.J. Clark is no slouch in the middle. And so, like – Like Grayson alluded to, the question is going to be about quarterback play, but even further, that receiver room. If the receiver room gives good things for NC State, it's not hard to see how they could be something special. And then the running back room, if you can get a little bit of juice out of there, you could also see something great happening. So, you know, NC State being a a team that is a dark horse and all that, there are a lot of questions and there are a lot of big ifs that you hope and wish and dream for to work out. So I understand the dark horse label and why you're not necessarily seen as the the top of the top of the creme de la creme per se of the contenders. But I also get the angle of why it would make sense for them to uh, to make a run here. All right, Damien, let's throw you in here as someone who has faced these Atlantic division foes a time or two. When you're talking about NC State as someone who, you know, they beat them a couple of times at that Clemson Clemson helm. How do you feel about NC State and their chances of maybe taking down Florida State or Clemson? I mean, you know, I think Kenton talked about it best. It starts with the quarterback. Everything, when you have a defense that can keep you in games, you can run the ball, create that play action. You want to get the box count that you want. You want to create the numbers advantage in the passing game. Brendan Armstrong, if he can get back to 2021, where he was one of the best quarterbacks in the country, you know, I had NFL scouts that I'm close to hitting me up last summer. Talking about, man, I, I went to I went to uh, Virginia. I seen this kid in person. He's got the big arm. He looks the part of an NFL quarterback. And with all the weapons they had, things just didn't go uh, the way that we expected to for Virginia last year. So if he can get back to that 2021 type of play, he can take this team uh, to new heights. And, and that's what that's what's so exciting about them is the the implementation of him in this offense, again, bringing in uh, a coach he's familiar with. As long as he plays at a high level, I think this is a team with the defense that can keep you at bay. Now all you got to do is score a certain – a lot of times when you have a great defense, you just tell your quarterback, I just need you to hit this point mark and we're fine. 
A thousand percent. All right, guys, let's talk about Florida State here. Round the horn. I just really want to start with Kenton first. Florida State is a team that has all the bells and whistles. And this season, they're dressed pretty nicely to take the nat- the national championship conversation a little bit further than we're used to seeing. And Mike Norvell is in year four. We're trying to figure out if he has the stuff to take them to that next level. But just let's start with the ACC championship mindset. Can they get it together and hopefully take down the big top dog clips and who we'll get to in just a bit? Can they? Absolutely. Absolutely. That is a team that is loaded at every position uh, for the most part. They've taken advantage of the transfer portal and and pulling out some of the they're one of the teams that made their competition lighter by getting better, pulling a Fentrail Cypress from UVA and saying, hey, you play pretty good ball over there. How about you play pretty good ball over here? So uh, this is this is a team, you know, Jared Verse is an animal. His tape excites me. It gets my motor going because I love seeing great D-line play. And boy, does he play that edge better than I've seen out of many players over the years. But with that being said, this team is very similar to where NC State is at from the from the angle of it's all about the quarterback. Yes, they have a different quarterback situation. Jordan Travis has been there for quite some time. We've seen the best of Jordan Travis. We've seen the worst of Jordan Travis. We've seen the tale of two cities. We're hoping that we get more Dr. uh, We're we're getting more Dr. Jekyll than Mr. Hyde, but there are moments where it gets kind of hairy with him. But when you have a running game like theirs, where you always have multiple backs rolling through, you always, always, always are going to see a full stable in that running game. I think the Florida state has all the makings of a team that could take down Clemson because let's just be honest. Clemson looked beatable a lot last year. If we're referencing the movie 300, when they made Xerxes bleed with the spear, that happened last year to Clemson to some extent. If we're looking at those last two games and even looking through some parts of their ACC schedule where they look very mortal and human. I mean, if this is, if Florida State wants to do it, this is their year because next year is going to be uh, a, a true testament of whether or not they're a rebuild or reload. And even if they are a reload team, you don't just reload a, a Jared Burks. You don't just reload a 6-7 guy that runs a 4-4 in Johnny Wilson. You don't just reload some of those pieces. So we'll be seeing. Now, Grayson, you're someone who has, of course, experienced that, that NC State-Florida State matchup. The rivalries have been pretty intense. Do you think this Florida State team is someone that we can't play games with this year, or is it an NC State? Mm, they have stuff, but they can't quite get it done. We've seen it in the past. Yeah, it's funny. Actually, on Twitter, I was talking to a lot of NC State fans and they were kind of doubting the Florida State hype this year. I do think the hype is very real. I think there's you know ample reason to believe that they are legit and probably will be in the ACC title game. But, I mean, you look at all the, the returners they had this year. Of course, Kenton touched on Jordan Travis. He was my vote for ACC preseason player of the year. I think he's extremely deserving of that. And, you know, the, the wide receiver, Johnny Wilson, I'm terrified of him. And if I were if I were a, a DB in the ACC, I'd be uh, I'd be counting my days so I got to face Mr. Wilson, but no, I think Florida State is very for real. I think they're going to go out and prove it. That game they have against Clemson is marquee television if I've ever seen it. Yeah. But, you know, yeah, NC State, we probably have a lot more questions than a Florida State does, and I certainly wish that NC State was afforded the opportunity to see uh, Florida State this year. It's kind of weird not seeing them on the schedule. It has been right. a, a regular occurrence. So I wish we could see who's who between those two teams in particular, but I certainly do think Florida State is for real. No doubt about it. Now, Damian, a lot of people are saying it's going to come down to Florida State or Clemson. They're going to meet each other again after meeting each other in the regular season. How timid or maybe ready for you know Florida State is Clemson this year? Uh, they better be ready. <laughs> That's the first thing I can say. They better. They have to be ready. This is a team. The ACC has a lot of talent, but this is a team that, for if you're a Clemson fan or a Clemson player, you circle that first matchup when they come to Death Valley because they have a six seven, two hundred thirty pound receiver in Johnny Wilson. They went and got six foot four, two fifteen in Keon Coleman from Michigan State. Trey Benson is about six one, six two, two two hundred plus pounds at running back, and then you have Houdini playing quarterback and Jordan Travis. And they have a good offensive line for the most part as well. Some NFL prospects, I think, at the left tackle position. They have to come into that game and under and they got to make sure that they take our business before them first and not overlook their opponents. But Florida State's the one like that's the one that matchup where I think with the playoff committee and everything, 
they're going to be taught their eyes are going to be glued to that matchup can nate wiggins have success again versus johnny wilson one-on-one right can sheridan jones handle keon coleman and with this star-studded defensive front for clemson can they keep trey benson that run game like under wraps to force kind of forcing them to play handicap, put play with one hand by tie behind their back and be more pass oriented than being balanced. If they can do that, that's going to be a big part of it. But Florida state's the team that I keep telling all my Clemson listeners, like you got to pay attention to this team. They're extremely talented. They're deep and they have high level football players that will be hearing their names called probably 2024 NFL draft very soon. Absolutely. We're talking about ACC contenders here for the 2023 football season. And it's my favorite time. No, it's not talking about Clemson just yet. It's about North Carolina. I know everyone's crazy about them, Drake, May, and company, and the eye rolls are popping, and that's just <laughs> fine with me. And if anyone knows Locked on ACC show, you know it's a time here between me and Kenton. But, Grace, I'm going to start with you. As someone who has seen some pretty good rivalries amongst North Carolina and NC State, how confident are you that North Carolina can even – I mean, they were preseason number three. How confident are you that they can even make the case to be in that championship game as they were last season? I, thir- I think they certainly can make a case, um, you know, despite my, you know, my, uh, my own grudges against the Blue School. Uh, you know, Drake May is the realest of deals. He's an incredible quarterback, incredible talent. I can only imagine he'll be even better this year than he was last year. But I also think North Carolina is benefiting a bit – from maybe an easier schedule, much to the chagrin of maybe a Mac Brown, but I think UNC will probably make a very solid case there by the end of this season. If they're knocking on the door, I, maybe they're not knocking on the door. I'd imagine either way they're going to be close. I would expect probably a nine and three, maybe a ten and two type year from North Carolina. Although NC State might have a word about that that last week in November there, but we've had their number the last couple times. But it's it's going to be yet another dogfight. See, Grayson, you're reminded me of Kenny. You do good. You give compliments, and then you backtrack. You have to remind yourself that you're definitely an NC State guy. I appreciate that, though. Hey, I I got to stay true to what I know. (laughs) 100%. Damian, you saw North Carolina in the championship last season. We know that it wasn't exactly this big bout, but it could be a defense that grows up in a big way, got rid of Coach Dre Bly. You have a new secondary and all the things. Could North Carolina be a contender here? I think they can. I think it's like you talked about defense. That's going to be probably the bigger part to me. And a couple of names that that you really that for me that I highlight: Miles Murphy, you know, defensive tackle, a guy that three tech, uh, nice first step, strong physical. He has all the tools and and makings of a disruptive defensive tackle. But you need to see that consistency from him uh, heading into this season, as well as uh, linebacker Cedric Gray. There's another young man that is really high level football player playing middle linebacker that you keep your eyes on because you know he's going he's kind of the green dot guy. The guy's going to call the plays, make the checks and everything like that and help get guys lined up. And those are the, those are the two guys in that front seven that's, that really makes the biggest impact or could make the biggest impact. Uh, if Miles Murphy, for one, takes that step, like he's going to help this defense tremendously because there's no faster path to the quarterback than right up the gut, right up, right up the middle. So uh, I'm looking at, at those two names uh, but the offensive line is going to be big for Drake May. Drake May is the second. He's QB2 for the NFL draft behind Caleb Williams for most people. Uh, and and it's, it's a, for me, it's a close race because I've scouted both of them. So, like, you know, just the, the, the offensive line protecting him, it's a lot of veterans, grand transfers, uh, red shirt junior, stuff like that on the O-line. And, then of course, the wide receiver position. No Josh Downs now. Antoine Green's going to, going to the NFL. So, Devontae's, uh Walker, who's a red shirt junior transfer, and then also getting senior transfer Nate McCullum, uh, the slot receiver from Georgia Tech, will be big for Drake May. A thousand percent agree there. I would go to Ken, but we don't know. Just kidding. Ken, please let us know Drake May and his weapons. Just how good will they be or have to be in order to be in that conversation to be contenders? They have to be historic. And I, I make no bones about that. Drake May has that ability. Let's let's put that out there right now. He has that ability. Last year was a historic season uh, for him in terms of touchdown interception ratio, total passing yards, total rushing yards in touchdowns he was the only player in the nation to have the combination that he did i I believe a four thousand or more yards five to one or better touchdown interception ratio and above 600 yards he was the only player in the nation to have that so um he has to be that plus some that's just the reality i mean if we're looking at unc and talking about who they are this is not a team where he can be good where he can even be great 
if that's no, 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 he has to be phenomenal. And I'll tell you this, if he wins the Heisman, if he puts on a Heisman worthy performance, UNC can get to the ACC championship. Anything short of that, it's not going to happen for him. Well, you know, guys, I hope that he does have a Heisman run because I will be talking cast junk on Locked on ACC till the end of time. Okay, let me help everybody understand. I mean, and you deserve it. And you deserve it. And let me tell you why you deserve it. Mm-hmm. Because, like I said, he needs to be historic because of the defense. The defense is the side of the ball. Let's look at all of the areas in which they finished last in the ACC. Points per game, last, 30.8. Yards per game, last, 436.5. Yards per carry in a running game, last with four and a half. Lee Sacks with 17. I'm pretty sure me and Damian could get out there and and, and get more sacks than what they had, even though our eligibility is expired. So, with (laughs) that being said, with that – Damien, am I lying? Am I lying? No, no, we can get in them trenches and do something now. <laughs> we can get in them trenches and do something now. I'll play the one tech to eat up they, the double yeah. teams for you. We can they get one seventeen. But they the reality, the reality is very simple. This defense has to get better. They have to retool after getting rid of their defensive back coach and Dre Bly after losing three fourths of their starters in the offseason. Drake May and this offense are going to have to be not good, great, phenomenal. Yep. Game in, game out. The lowest I think they'll be able to score in any game this year and win is 24. Absolute lowest. Wonderful. Well, I'm glad that y'all have hope and grace. I have made up my mind a long time ago, you know, it's to keep peace in my household and to strengthen mine that I have no expectations for North Carolina. I really, it's just better that way. Cause when you don't expect anything, they do a little bit good when you expect too much and you get high on them. And I really felt like Drake, I didn't even feel like Drake May was going to be good. I thought Sam Howell the last year, they were, we were, we were going to be contenders, college football playoffs and they played my face. So I'm not doing that anymore. All I know is, <laughs> I'm kind of glad Dre is gone. I'm kind of glad that secondary got a little shift. And maybe just maybe Gus can do something in that defense because we're going to need a miracle. It's going to take a miracle somehow. But I feel I feel good. Contenders, I don't know. I think that's aggressive. But number three preseason poll is certainly something that they've all decided for us. Now, could someone make a dark horse run this season in the ACC? We tackle that next on Ultimate College Football Preview on Locked On ACC. First, I want to remind all of our friends here, as we love to pay some bills, that each and every day when you are trying to make an opportunity to get a new job, there is every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. You can post your job at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Terms and conditions do apply. All you got to do is add that purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile. Spread the word that you're hiring. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on the candidates and just the right skills experience so you can prioritize what you, who you'd like to interview. Go to LinkedIn Jobs to find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college. Terms and conditions do apply. All right, what's up, everybody? We have a new crew, but it doesn't mean we won't have as much fun. 2023 College Preview on ACC, Locked On locked on Podcast Network. We've got Kenton, we've got Dalton, we've got Alex, Owen, AJ, and JJ. Man, try and try to say that four times fast, right? We are talking all things ACC football. We got a lot of things going this season. We had our contenders on. Now we've got guys who are in the fight trying to make names for their programs. Dalton, I'll start with you. Locked on Louisville. We know that, you know, Brom is here and everyone's excited. All we were doing was missing the coach. We call him the fighting Satterfields, but now it seems we need to find the fighting Jack Plummer and the boys. So can you please explain to the people what we're going to get out of the Cardinals this season? The fighting plumbers. I like that. I'm going to run with that. That's actually, I've never heard fighting Satterfields though. I don't think I ever want to hear that again. (laughs) Thankfully I won't. Um, But yeah, I mean, I think that as far as the off season went, it probably went as good as you could have hoped for. If you were a Louisville fan, you upgrade your coaching staff, you upgrade the roster as a whole. You retain a lot of the players that you had. You don't lose a lot to the portal or to the NFL draft outside of a couple positions. There's a lot of momentum heading into the fall and couple that with a schedule that many are calling one of, if not the easiest schedule of any Power 5 team. You escape Clemson. You escape 
NC, or I'm sorry, not NC State, North Carolina, and you escape Florida State. So um, I, I hate to put the cart before the horse here, but there is an avenue if everything goes according to plan to where you might be in contention for that ACC championship um, come December. But like I said, that is sort of a ceiling type uh, situation for Louisville. But for lack of better terms, there, there's a lot of momentum. There's a lot of optimism. And I think anything short of about – eight wins is probably going to be looked at by many as um, falling a little bit short in year one. Eight win, Kitten, go ahead. I Listen, the finding Jack Plummers and like being happy with that moniker is kind of insane. That's a little, <laughs> no disrespect to Jack Plummer, but what has he done to, to give this much confidence? Coach Brown, I understand it, right? He's a Louisville guy through and through. His little brother played there. Both great quarterbacks. They're all that good stuff. Sure. What under God's green earth has Jack Plummer done for Louisville fans to be so confident behind the black? That's our QB one. We're going to knock him down. Whoa, 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 whoa. I understand the schedule is easy. I love your defense. Aston Gelati is one of the most underrated edge rushers in the country to me. Oh, no doubt about it. That man can get it done. He's a ball of butcher knives and energy. But with that being said, there are still many too many questions at many too many important positions particularly the quarterback position where I'm like, I'm, uh, again, like you said, ceiling, sure, I could see it with your schedule and with the defense you all have. Ceiling, I could for sure see you going to an ACC championship. Realistically, every team can't hit their ceiling. That's just not not how the numbers work out. And unfortunately, I think Louisville is going to be one of those teams that just falls short of that ceiling. Okay, I thought there was a question there. Maybe not. All right, Alex Dono, we're going to Locked on Miami. We're talking about Locked on Canes, really. Now, Alex, we have a great time every time we get together. We talk all the highs, the lows, and all that in between. I want to know, We're not. I'm not even going to ask you about that. Is it, are they that question? I'm going to say, what am I going to get out of this Miami team under this Mario regime and the discipline that sees before it, but the discipline that he has put before him? That's a big question. And just talking about ceilings there, I think Miami's got one of the highest ceilings, but one of the lowest floors also in the ACC. And, you know, not only coming off a five and seven season, which I didn't even imagine was possible last year. Like I would have thought, you know, six and six, seven and five would have been a doomsday type scenario. But what makes Miami so unpredictable again this year, there's a lot that I like about what they're doing to overhaul the roster and the coaching staff, but there's still a lot of variables. They overturned literally more than half the roster. They've got 45 different scholarship players from a year ago. That's that's just an insane amount of turnover. That's like kind of like what Dion is doing in Colorado. It's that type of turnover. They turned over a lot of different coaches as well. So I can sit and look at the majority of the changes they've made, I believe, are positive, but you still have the question of how's everything going to fit together? Now, you know, if Miami's going to try and be closer to their ceiling and, and – Who the heck knows what the ceiling is? You could talk to one Miami fan. They'll tell you the ceiling is 11 wins. Another might tell you the ceiling's like eight wins, right? Uh, But if they're going to get anywhere close to that, they've got to keep their quarterback protected. Um, You know, there was a lot of disappointment um, last year with Tyler Van Dyke under center. But some of that disappointment just came from him getting battered by his offensive line because there were a couple of games. He played great against North Carolina in a loss, but that was not his fault. Uh, he was he played really well the following league against a bad Virginia Tech team, and then he got hurt against Duke, and he never really came back. He tried to come back, but the shoulder just wasn't right because he kept getting battered behind that offensive line. They go out and they get J.V. on Cohen, the former starting left guard at Alabama. They got uh, a center who everyone's really excited about in South Florida, Matt Lee from UCF. They bring in two five-star offensive tackles. So I think that's an area they're looking to fix. They also gave Tyler Van Dyke a couple more weapons to throw the football to. Uh, Tyler Harrell and Shamar Kirk were added in the transfer portal. A couple of young guys that uh, that look really promising on paper. So uh, I think the ingredients are there. It's just how are they all going to fit together? We don't know what the recipe is. Like we don't know, you know, where to sprinkle in this and that. How everyone's going to work together. I think that's why Miami's so unpredictable heading into this year. I 100% agree. Now, I'm going to switch gears to Owen here. Locked on Syracuse. Dino might be the only one in this group. Maybe another one, but we'll talk about it. Fighting for that job, trying to make sure that they are all good to go when it's said and done. Now, we talked about eight wins for some of these teams. How many wins does Dino need to pull off in order to keep his, yeah, 
Oh, Keep the what lights a question. On. What a question. <laughs> I have no idea how many wins he needs to stay. He has yeah. had just a crazy sort of span at Syracuse with mm-hmm. some great seasons, some terrible seasons, everywhere in between. I don't really know what the threshold is. I will say it seems like John Wildack and the athletic department really like Dino Babers from what is sort of presented publicly and the support he continues to get. I think personally – it's hard to say no if he gets Syracuse back to another bowl game, back-to-back seasons, gets to a bowl. I mean, this is Syracuse football. We're talking about a program that is working to play in a bowl game. And it was crazy to see last season that you're frustrated in a bowl game just because of the way it happens, right? You start out 6-0, and then you lose five straight. So even in a relatively good season for Dino Babers, you're questioning – you know, what the heck is going on here? How is this what's going on? Uh, Battled through injury, obviously. But I think this is a team that, because you've got some veteran guys in in key roles, especially at the quarterback, and then with Aronde Gadsden, who's making a lot of news uh, in in the preseason, uh, whether he's a tight end, whether he's a wide receiver, whatever you want to call him, those two really like each other. They play well off of each other. And I, I think that in itself, plus Dino, you know, fighting for his career, fighting for an extension here, is something that can propel Syracuse to that bowl game success. I don't know if you're, you're talking eight wins here. I don't know if you're talking uh, a possible contender to be a dark horse for the ACC, but I think you are talking about a team that needs to make a bowl game and a coach that needs to get to that threshold and a team that has the capacity and the skill set to make it there as well. Couldn't agree more. Now we're moving on here to AJ Black, who from Locked On Boston College, I'm sure has had a mouthful when it comes to Jeff Happily and the boys and how they're just going to get through, just get through the season, right? We don't, we don't need highs. We don't need a lot of love. We just want to get through this season. What is the feeling in Chestnut Hill right now? I think we're kind of underselling like, just getting through the season here because <laughs> It's BC is one of like, I think five teams in the country. That's not playing a power five conference team in the out of conference schedule. They play Yukon army NIU and Holy cross. So they, they're setting themselves up right there for success. And they avoid all four um, um, tobacco road programs. They don't play NC state wake forest, Duke or UNC this year. So that in itself sets them up with the easy, the easiest schedule according to FBI on ESPN, the easiest schedule in the nation. Um, uh, for BC, it's all up front. It's the trenches. Last year, they got hammered on the offensive line. Uh, they lost four of their guys in the NFL draft in 2022. Their, you know, Christian Mahogany blew his knee out playing basketball in the offseason. They go in. They continue losing guys. They're, they're plugging in guys on the defensive line. They're doing everything they can to kind of put, you know, make things meet. They end up three and nine. Terrible season. They get Mahogany back. He's going to be All-American. They bring in two transfers, um, Kyle Hergel from Texas State, who's played for a couple years for North Dakota and Texas State. They bring in Logan Taylor from UVA. And they have two four-stars in Drew Kendall and Ozzie Trapillo, who now no longer have guys next to them that don't have any idea what they're doing. (laughs) That in itself should make Boston College a better team. I think for Boston College, anything less than a bowl game this year is a major indictment on the program because they're playing a schedule at least with four wins already in there when you're playing an out-of-conference schedule that's that's set up for them to win, and you don't have to play Clemson. You don't have to play Wake Forest. You don't have to play NC State. That's a big deal for BC. They should be able to, to pull off some big wins. I think they're gonna they're in for a bigger season than a lot of folks are are preparing them to have. Well, let's let's hope they don't smoke the layups. That's all I'm asking. Like, please, for the sake of the conference, don't smoke Mm -hmm. the layups. Now, my favorite, uh, I don't know if anyone's ever listened to Locked on ACC, but I do have a particular program, a football program that I love to talk about, and that is Duke football. Surprisingly enough, I like them because they win me money because people doubt them, but here we are. J.J. Jackson, long time senior, but it's so good to talk to you again. These Blue Devils have given people a lot of hope. A lot of people have turned the page and said, okay, we cannot sleep on Duke. How do you feel like the Blue Devils are going to do in year two for Mike Elko? When so many people talk about the second year coming up this year, 
often the conversation starts with John Shire and the basketball program. And yet we're talking a lot about Mike Elko and what he's going to do in his second season leading this football team. It helps that you've got a quarterback in Riley Leonard coming back, who many believe is one of the top quarterbacks in the conference, possibly the country. Uh, the question marks, though, for this Duke team are going to be on that defensive side of the football and then making up for the lack in talent that they've got in some areas because at the end of the day, it is a Duke football program. Very excited, lots of reasons to be optimistic. But as Mike Elko was quick to point out at ACC kickoff last week, it's a difficult schedule for Duke, much difficult than, much more difficult than it was in year one for him. So while it might not end in as many wins as the program was a year ago, I think you are seeing a program that's taking steps in the right direction. All right, I'm just going to let you know, JJ, I put 150 down on 10 wins. So <laughs> let me, and that includes a bowl game. That includes a bowl game. I know everybody's eyes got big, but I got 150 down between Ken, who's shaking it. And you, I'm just letting you know. That's so, a lot of optimism. I love I, it. I might have to bring you back so you can figure it out and help me. <laughs> Before I get you guys out of here, I would like to know just around the horn the best game that you guys need to tell these fans to have circled on the calendar against your programs. What would that be? I'll start with you, AJ. I'm going to go with Pitt. I think Pitt's a, a very good team. Phil Dracovic against Boston College, you know, their old quarterback. Frank Signetti, their old offensive coordinator. Circle that game. That's going to be a fun one. It's going to be a weekday game. I think it's a Thursday night game. Uh, I think that's going to be a big one at the end of the season for BC. Alex, what about you? Yeah, there's a handful of options on Miami's schedule, and it's not an easy schedule, but the one that I have circled, and it's mainly based on how early it is, non-conference at home against Texas A&M, because that – you know, my, Miami plays Miami, Ohio week one. I don't know what kind of a barometer that's going to be, but then week two against Texas a and that's really going to kind of tell you, you know, is Miami actually for real? Do they mean business or not? So that that's the one that I have circled September 9th. No doubt. Dalton. It's a pretty easy one, straightforward. The Governor's Cup final game of the regular season against Kentucky. Cardinals haven't been – well, they were competitive last year, but hadn't been since Lamar Jackson back in 2017. And uh, finally, we have a coach that understands the rivalry. So um, all our eyes are on that, and we'll, we'll be focusing on that one. J.J. Let's go to the first game of the season for Duke. Playing on Labor Day, a primetime spot against Clemson. A lot of people are going to be really curious what exactly that second year looks like for Mike Elko. And again, if you like quarterbacks, make sure you pay attention to Riley Leonard this season. 100%. Owen, we in with you. I got it. I'll be redundant here. September 30th, Syracuse Clemson. For whatever reason, Syracuse plays Clemson close for three <laughs> quarters every year. Uh, maybe if things work out, they can repeat the 2018 scenario. But, hey, uh, this is a team that's played them close. They were there last season, fell short. Home, uh, Not the home opener, ACC opener for Syracuse. Should be a packed dome. Syracuse loves to get out for Clemson. It's that yeah. Duke effect for basketball, the Clemson effect for football. Uh, Syracuse is involved. So we'll see what happens with that one. No doubt about it. Kenton, we'll end with you. Of all these teams here, who is the best dark horse who might have an actual run to be a good contender? You know, I I got to do this to make up for what I said earlier, because when I was told that you got to make it a little grim in here, maybe I made it too grim for the Louisville Cardinals, but I really, really do love that team. I absolutely love them. Uh, Duke, with all due respect, I think that they were inflated by a terrible coastal last year. But Elko did have the greatest start of any coach in Duke history outside of Wallace Wade in year one. So that was fantastic for them. Boston College returning 80% of their production statistically last year. Good for them. Still not good players, even if they're returning. Syracuse, we're fighting for Dino's job, right? Like we're not really looking at that type of situation. Miami is the team that of these teams has the highest ceiling. But like Alex said, the lowest floor. The problem with this team last year wasn't talent. It was chemistry. It was chemistry, and you solved the chemistry issue by turning over half the roster. What? Is, what I, I, you know, I, it's it's a little – it boggles the mind a little bit. I understand that you're a new coach, wanting to get your system, your guys in, but, you know, this is a team that's always had first-rounders, and, and, and the, the solution to them not gelling right ain't to bring in more players to try to gel immediately. So, of all these teams – if Jack Plummer is what Louisville fans tell me he is, 
If if I'm wrong, I'll I'll be happy to admit it. I was happy to pay up to Candace last year when I was wrong, and I'll, I'll be happy to give Louisville fans their fly. I love the city of Louisville. It's a great time every time I go. I think that they have the best shot out of all these teams to get it done and be in the ACC championship and potentially win going forward. Love to see it. Guys, we appreciate you for coming on, and we really appreciate you for giving your takes. Make sure you follow their respective podcasts. Will the ACC have playoff representation this season? That's next on the Ultimate College Football Preview on Locked on ACC. I want to talk about our friends here at Bird Dogs. Listen, Bird Dogs makes you look good. Bird Dogs has stretch khaki shorts that are designed to fit slimmer through the thigh and leg, giving you a truly sculpted look. Bird Dog shorts do the exact same thing as Lululemon, but fit way better. They fit way better than regular shorts that are made of stiff, restriction cotton. Bird Dogs fix the issue by inventing cloud knit fabric that looks just like khaki, but stretches so you get a way slimmer fit without having to sacrifice the movement. Bird Dogs uses anti-stink sweat wicking fabric that keeps you cool and dry all day long. How mature am I? Now go to birddogs.com slash locked on college and a promo code locked on college for free white tech hat with your order that's birddog.com slash locked on college by entering promo code locked on college for a free white tech hat you won't want to take your bird dogs off we promise you All right, so we're talking about national playoff hopes here, 2023 college preview. And let me just tell you, when it comes to national conversations, the ACC certainly gets slighted the most out of any group. I'm not going to hold you. Out of all the power fives, I feel like we get a little janky. But if we're just going to talk about who off the gate besides Clemson could be that one, Clemson, Mr. Damien, tell us why not only are you guys ACC championship contenders, but also have that national playoff conversation expectation. Man, the, the level of talent on this team is some of the best that I've seen, right? From the front lines on the defense, say they, have the, they have the best linebacker duo in the country. You know what I mean? With, with Bear Carter and Jeremiah Charter, these are two high impact and high level players. But when you look at the defensive line, Rook, Row, 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 and Ty, you know, Tyler Davis on the interior, Peyton Page backing those guys up as a big 315 nose tackle. But then Xavier Thomas healthy, mentally in a good place, right? Looks ready to go and, and things of that nature. And when you have the secondary that you have with two of the best safeties in college football, R.J. Mickens and Andrew McCuba, who is also a friend of the show, uh, you know, you know, you have the versatility. The big thing for them is year two in West Goodwin system and this defensive system since Brent Venables uh, went to uh, to Oklahoma. So this team is going to ride off of the defense, but then offensively with this new spread air raid offense that Garrett Riley's bringing in, it's a total different feel uh, offensively. We watched TCU last year. You saw spacing. You saw a lot of different sets, open concepts. And when you have an athlete – like DJU is athletic for his size, but K. Clemens is a two-sport athlete, a track guy who also played football. And his athleticism, his ability to work with his legs and improvise. With you create space with Will Shipley and Phil Moffa in the backfield, Antonio Williams in his true sophomore year, returning as the leading receiver, Cole Turner, the basketball star with deep speed. Adam Randall, six foot, six two, six three, two thirty. You have a lot of options, a lot of weapons on this team to where all they need is for K. Clubman to get himself into a rhythm. Don't come out pressing. And if he just does what he needs to do, be a point guard, distribute when you need to, to improvise, improvise. But all in all, from top to bottom, this is a sh- incredibly talented team. And they have an outstanding coach, too. So they have a lot of different coaches on this roster, on this staff that's going to help those guys be prepared. Just got to go out there and handle business. Not you love Dabo. That's a whole, that's a show in there. We can have, we can have a whole separate <laughs> episode on that one. Kitten, now we know not only do they have to be good for the national side of things, but the ACC, how well does Clemson have to do this current to keep elevating the ACC's national pre- prevalence and more importantly, to be in contention for that college football playoff? So this is about Clemson, but I'll, I'll make this about all the ACC for a second. We can't have anybody with two or more losses. We cannot have a single two or more loss team. And let me tell you why. The pack, however many they are now, I really discount them. (laughs) Whatever. Ho-hum. No big deal. However, the SEC, regardless of what happens, they're probably – they're guaranteed one 
regardless of even if their champion has three losses, they're going to say, oh, well, you lost to Wayne Kiffin, the, the offensive genius. You lost to Nick Saban. You lost to Kirby Smart. It's okay. It's no big deal, you know. If uh, Zach Black would be boy down in Auburn lose those three games and they happen to win it, <laughs> they're going to get in. That's what's going to happen. So the reality here is very simple. The Big Ten, same type of deal. The Big Ten is different from us in that their bottom teams are really terrible. Like, they're middle of the road down, god awful. So, with that being said, they're going to have either Michigan, Ohio State, or if another team pops out and Fleck finally rows the boat up there in Minnesota, whatever the case may be, they're going to have a team with one loss, two losses max. But with that being said, looking at the ACC now, you have to count on multiple things going wrong in other conferences in order for us to have a two-loss champion and get in. If you were, say, two losses for Clemson, well, who does Clemson lose to? Who do they lose to, right? You say that Florida State, okay, great. That's a game that you could possibly lose and be okay with. But after that, who else can you lose to? You can't lose to South Carolina because many people aren't thinking South Carolina is going to be a top dog in the AC, in the SEC this year. You can't lose to any other team in the conference because two conference losses now, you're at risk of not even making the conference championship game. So for all of the conference, for the entire conference, we can't have two losses. But for Clemson in particular, I mean, again, you could get away with one to a great team. You can't get away with two. Yeah, I totally agree there. Grayson, we know Clemson is Clemson. They have set the bar, the standard for the ACC, and we know how much they are going to be the name that carries us through in national conversations. But there is there any other team here in our conference that you say, you know what, maybe give a second look, national voters. Maybe, maybe look you know, the other way and give us a little chance. Yeah, I mean, the only other obvious answer here would be Florida State. And it's going to be Clemson, Florida State, one and two for, you know, the majority of the season. I really don't know if I'd put any merit into another team possibly sneaking in. You know, maybe you get a UNC. If, by, by God's grace, you get an NC State in there. I, I don't see that happening. But, you know, Miami, I think there's still a lot of question marks. Some people are high on Louisville. Some people are low on Louisville. I have no idea what to expect from them this year. <laughs> But the answer is Florida State. I mean, they are legit on both sides of the ball. Like I mentioned before, they have Jordan Travis. They have Johnny Wilson. They have Jared Verse. They have Mike Norvell. I think they're going to put rubber to the road, and they're going to make it happen. And because I have you guys here, might as well ask. You guys are all um, Atlantic Division guys. And, of course, you talk about national performance. And now not having division, do you feel like there's a better chance for your respective schools and even for Florida State that we've been mentioning to be in national conversations than you have to play the best of the best within the conference? Damien, I'll start with you. I think so. I think when you just make it a, a big pot, a league Right. Where instead of this, you know, East and West and things of that nature where anyone can face everyone, basically. And you got to run the gauntlet, run the table. You know, when you separate by conference, you know, if one conference stronger than the other, you know, they might beat up on each other and, and have multiple losses. Right. Like like Kenton talking about, you don't want to have two, three losses. Right. Other ones is weak. So it's, it's like the Big Ten, truthfully. Uh, you know, you, Big Ten's got Michigan, though, I think Ohio State in the same Conference where the other side, no one knows who plays over there. Michigan, so, Ohio State, and Penn Michigan, State Ohio all State. on the same side. Michigan, Ohio <laughs> State, Penn State all on the same side. Ridiculous. And no one knows who plays on the other side of that on the other side of that conference. So like you don't want that. So I think opening it up the way it is, it does give a, a better chance and get, get a better chance to get more respect from the national media and hopefully the uh, college play college football playoff voters. Grayson, I'll kick it to you. Yeah, no, I agree. I think the the one mega conference, that was the best scenario. I, You know, NC State fans have kind of poked fun at UNC uh, for quite some time now because we've always kind of felt like the coastal side was just weaker. It just flat out was because you have a Clemson on one side. You have a Florida State on one side. NC State's had a couple good teams in there. You had Louisville with Lamar Jackson knocking on the door, and they were all in the Atlantic Division. And on the coastal, you see, you know, Pitt had a good year that one time. Duke's been kind of all over the place. Miami's been all over the place. I think having all the teams just in one conference, you you create the scenario where you are getting truly the best two teams in the ACC. And then, yes, the winner of that more than likely will go to the CFP. So I think this was the right decision all in all. Kitten, end us on a good one. All of the Atlantic teams that complained about, oh, we got all the tough teams to play. All right, shut up. Time to show and prove. 
That's it's right. It's time to show and prove. Yes, it's great for the conference to get rid of the divisions. Absolutely. And you know what? If we get a Florida State and Clemson rematch in the championship, I don't care. That was the de facto uh, ACC championship game for quite some time right. until all of a sudden they decided to go play the boys at Bama down there in Tallahassee. I don't know why they did that. It is neither here nor there. That's, that's not, not what we're talking about. Uh, the reality is very simple. It is going to be the two best teams. That's what, it, that's what we're going to see. I don't care if we're seeing a rematch of one of the last weeks uh, of the season. I don't care. I, I have no qualms about that. I want to see the two best teams play. Nationally, they want to see the two best teams play. Now, is there a chance of that whole cannibalizing each other thing happening and one team beating one team during the regular season and then you know how hard it is to beat somebody twice so they end up splitting and the lesser of the two teams ends up getting the win at the end of the season? Sure, that's possible. But the reality is I'd rather have that than have uh, what we've seen in the past with a, a six, seven win team out of one side. Won't say which side has dragged out uh, teams with six wins, but there was one who did that and their team had to get a waiver to play in the bowl game because they'd have a losing record. But that's neither here nor there. The fact of the matter is very simple. Uh, the best teams should play each other in the championship. That's what we want to see. Sure. And as the girl who is holding it down for the Coastal here, I will say I'm excited to see what some of the Coastal teams can do, whether they can pull off some upsets. It's a put up or shut up type of year. Can they actually hold their own in what everyone says is a much harder division? You got some games that are going to be, listen, the Coastal is ready. Duke is ready. North Carolina is ready. Pitt better be ready. Okay. Some people are going to be losing their jobs at the bottom of that Atlantic, but it's fine. I think I'm excited to see what can happen when you just put up or shut up and play the game. So I totally, I hear all of you and I received that, you know, again, one, one person holding it down for the coastal, but I think it's going to be a good time had by all. Now that you know who the players are for the ACC, join me, Caroline Fenton, as we break down who makes the college football playoff and who will ultimately win it all. Go to Locked on ACC or wherever you get your podcasts for this bonus episode of the Ultimate College Football Preview.